Welcome, everyone. Hi to the 24th Miami Jewish Film Festival. I'm Dr. Miriam Klein Kasanoff, Director of the University of Miami Holocaust Teacher Institute and a devoted volunteer and supporter of the Miami Jewish Film Festival. And I'm so pleased to have the opportunity to moderate and have a conversation with Lynn and Eddie Goldfarb about their film, Eddie's World, that's premiering at this year's Jewish Film Festival. So let's begin. Lynn, I'm going to start with you, although the star of the film is your dad, we'll get to him. Tell me, Lynn, um, you're an award-winning um, film producer, I understand. Uh, you've won a couple of Academy Awards, is that true? No, I was nominated for an Academy Award, well, but- Okay, that, 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 that's good too. Yeah. Uh, when and why did you first know and feel that you just had to make this film about your dad? What was the incident, the moment that you said, you know what, it's time for me to make this film? Well, it's actually interesting. I had been, I had finished working on another film and, and where I had to raise all the money and we were doing this self distribution and I was feeling like I didn't really, I wasn't sure whether I was gonna make another film. And so I decided that and, and I kind of looked around and realized that, you know, my dad was in his 90s. And I said, this is a perfect time to do a family legacy project because I'm not sure what I'm doing next. And I have the time and, and you know, we can do this. And so we set it up to really do, you know, family, you know, oral his filmed oral history, but we, filmed it with very good equipment. And we, at the moment we set it up and I started talking to my father, um, interviewing him on film, I realized I had a film. And so it kind of changed that. We did, we did do about um, eight hours worth of interviews, you know, as, as part of this. So we would have the family legacy part but, you know, he's such a great storyteller. Yeah. And the moment he started telling stories and answering questions, I realized it was a film and then we just started. And it's a about, wonderful yeah. film. I loved it. Yeah. I sat on my patio here in Miami Beach on my iPad and I just was so enthralled with it. I thought, who knew? Yeah. Who knew that, that, that this man was behind all this. So before I get to him, I'm gonna ask you this question and then I'll ask Eddie. Um, when you said to him, you know what, Deb? I'm gonna make a film about you. What exactly did he say to you? <laughs> well, he said, of course, you know, I mean, that's kind of what you, you know, families do. And, and you know, and I've been a documentary filmmaker my whole career and my dad, you know, known that and seen, you know, my films. But I think you never understand the process of filmmaking when you go through it, when you're the subject. You know, it's a very different thing when you kind of, you know, go through all the details. So I don't think he really, you know, understood everything that we were doing and why we were doing it until we saw the final piece. But of course he was, available and, you know, interested, so. So tell me, were there any major obstacles uh, that you encountered while doing it? Or did it all go very smoothly? Because the film does flow very easily and it's fun to watch. Mm -hmm. No, there were no major obstacles at all. I mean, probably the biggest thing is that my dad likes to stop we're at about 3.30 in the afternoon, you know, to get ready for dinner and just kind of to make that day, you know, and, and um, 
and we're used to make, having a lot longer days in filming. So we, you know, adjusted our schedule accordingly. And probably the other thing that wasn't an obstacle, but rather an opportunity is I thought we were pretty close to being done filming when he got a 3D printer. And then I realized, that, oh, this story is really going to take on a different life as well. So then we continued actually to film for quite a bit longer because of that. Okay, so Eddie, I'm, okay. switching, I'm switching over to you now. Um, I read some background information on you. And before we even talk about the film, I really want to know more about your family background. Um, I'm from Czechoslovakia, and I noted that your parents were from Lithuania and Poland. Am I correct? Romania. And Romania. Poland. Oh, boy, I'm making a few mistakes here. But <laughs> hey, at least I'm on the right track. I did do my research. So what I want to know is more about your family background, your early years have formed you. Tell me about your family, your parents, who they were, and what they instilled in you as a young man that might have formed you to taking risks and to do the things that you've done. Tell us a little bit about that and your parents. Well, as I told you, my mother was from Romania, my father was from Poland, and his whole family came over, and they uh, settled mostly in Cleveland and Toledo, and my father came here for some reason, and he met my mother in Chicago, where some of her family lived, and uh, they got married, and they had three kids, and I'm the middle one. Uh, I so, had, Eddie, um, what year did they come over from Europe? They came before the Second World War, right? Oh, way before, way before. Yeah. yeah. What years did they live in Cleveland, Ohio? They were still living there, but I have no relationship with them anymore. Uh, but they're still there. And I had, I really never had a real relationship with them. I knew them when they visited. My father died when I was 12. And that's the first time I met some of my uncles. We, they came into Chicago. Well, and the reason I ask about Cleveland is I happen to have grown up in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I, when I came to America, which was during World War II as a child, um, we lived in Cleveland. My father was a rabbi. And uh, so I was just wondering if maybe I might have heard or known of uh, some of the family. But as you say, you have not been in touch with them very much. Um, I remember my sister was, is uh, two years younger. She's doing fine. She's at a retirement area in New Mexico. And uh, she visited them because we all had to work to get to uh, make things happen. And uh, she was too young. I was 12. I was able to work. And so she went on vacations there, uh, mm -hmm. I believe, for a couple of years and met all her relatives. And they were wonderful to her. And they even bought her a bike. And she made certain it was a boy's bike so I could use it as well actually I she really gave it to me I took it over <laughs> so anyway so Chicago is our home and uh and uh well Chicago also is another place I lived as well so um sounds to me like there's longevity in your family you say your sister is two years younger than you would you mind telling the audience how old you are, even though you don't look it, whatever that means. <laughs> 99. Are you? And I'll be 100 in September. No. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. I don't believe it. Well, my goodness, that's just wonderful. So 
you've had quite a life. And um, I want to go back to uh, when you first started thinking in your head that these are the wonderful thoughts and ideas and inventions that you created. Um, I noticed in the film, there was a mention that you joined the Navy. Do I have that correct? Uh, at the beginning of World War II, yes. Two, yeah. And um, did anything special occur in your time in the Navy that impacted you strongly that also led you to realize that you had a talent for the kind of inventions that you ultimately made? Did anything well, particularly impact you there then? Actually, it started much earlier. Oh, okay. I when I was a very young child, I have an early memory that my father brought home an inventor. And that's the, I must have been five years old or something. And uh, that's when I learned what an inventor was. I have no idea what he invented or he worked at the same place my father did. So, uh, uh, but that's when I found out what an inventor was. And I knew from that point on that I was going to be an, an inventor. And, and I knew I was going to be an independent inventor. There are wonderful, wonderful inventors who work for companies, but I always knew I wanted to be on my own. Uh, an earlier incident happened. Uh, before that, uh, the, my father brought home one of the very early radios and he couldn't make it work. And uh, he was upset and he gave it to me. <laughs> Even though I had an older brother, <laughs> he gave it to me. And of, of course I couldn't make it work. Uh, it was an, uh, an early crystal radio. And I took it apart though, and I found out what a battery was and I made sparks and I enjoyed and I learned what the parts were. And uh, I, I, I was very interested in uh, technical items. My older brother went to a uh, uh, boys high school as, and uh, brought home uh, popular science every uh, every month and gave it to me and I read that through and I, I was always, so I was inventing as from my earliest memories. How old were you when you uh, turned the radio inside out? When my father gave me the radio, I must have been four or five. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Lynn, I see you smiling and nodding your head. So. Let's skip over to you. Do you have comments to make about that? Or do you remember um, in the film, uh, I noted that uh, Eddie was driven no matter what to work at his talent. And when he got married um, and you moved, I believe to, I don't want to say the wrong city, <laughs> uh, but you moved and then you were born. And I'm wondering as you were growing up, um, tell us your memories of watching your dad working at all these things and inventing and what were you thinking? Well, I think I'll try to, try to answer the first part of the question um, uh, first. I mean, I, I love these stories, so I'm always happy to hear my father, you know, tell them. And there's always stories that, there's great stories that don't make it in the film, so I like, you know, hearing mm -hmm. about them. Yes. So my, I was born in Chicago and my um, parents moved to California when I was two years old. So I grew up in, in, in California. My mother supported my father in the beginning. You know, they made, you know, uh, an agreement that I think that he would have two years to see if he could make it as an independent inventor. And she would support him during that time. And he did, he did, you know, succeed. Um, and he started in Chicago and then, you know, moved out to Los Angeles. Uh, 
And in the beginning, my dad would work in our garage. He would make um, that into a workshop, but I was quite young, you know? And so I don't really remember, you know, him working on toys, you know, at home. And I mean, that's part of what the film does actually, which is in, you know, which has been a great experience for me. My dad, as soon as he could, he was able to, you know, uh, work outside the home, rent and, and then buy a shop and hire other people to help. So we never actually saw him working at home. I see. You know, um, he would bring home prototypes of toys for us to try out or we, we would he'd talk about things. And with the film, I had the opportunity to watch him at work, you know, in you know, in his garage machine shop, which is just kind of part of what he does. But as children, you know, or as a family, he would never have worked when we came to visit. So it was really a unique opportunity as a filmmaker to really witness my dad working in a way that I wouldn't be able to. Well, I find that interesting because if indeed his work was his hobby and his work, then what did he do when he came home? Did he, what was his relaxation? Uh, TV, watching the newspaper? Oh, I don't, he would, he would be with family, you know. He we was family, he spent time with you and the children. Yeah. That's wonderful. That's wonderful that he kept his work and his hobby separate uh, from the family. Um, so, it was, well, no, go ahead, Eddie. It was never a really a hobby. I, it, it was what I did, and uh, uh, and it turned into I was able to hire more and more people, and I ended up with thirty nine people: engineers and designers and sculptors, wow. artists. And I uh, had a wonderful relationship with some wonderful, wonderful people over, over the years. They, they were with me for easily 30 years, most of them, you know. Uh, it, it really was a talent. Um, in the film, you said something that really uh, struck me because I, I kind of, um, I'm like you in this way and what I do. You said that uh, it all comes so naturally to you. You see a need for something and then you envision it and then you create it. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to ask you, um, for example, when and how did you first see the need for the famous clicking teeth? What, what inspired you that you thought I need to invent that. Could you tell us about that? Okay, but that goes back uh, years before also. Uh, during the war I went in and uh, I, I went into a special division uh, to uh, learn about the secret of radar. Radar was top secret then and uh, so I went in uh, and was sent to University of Houston and, and then to San Francisco to schools. And, uh, and then uh, when I finished uh, my uh, uh, learning period, I volunteered for submarine duty. And so I spent uh, the whole war on a, uh, on a submarine uh, in the Pacific. And uh, before the war, I was always inventing from one industry to another, uh, never really succeeding. I got letters from manufacturers asking if I had a patent and things like that. And I never did, of course. I was, I was in uh, school. Uh, but uh, uh, during the war, during the war, especially after World War II ended. I was always in the Pacific, of course. I was on a submarine. All oh, wow. our submarines were in the Pacific fighting the Japanese. 
And uh, uh, when the war in Europe ended, we still had the war against Japan. And I knew it could easily last three or four years. I didn't know about the atomic bomb. And, but I still felt I better figure out what the heck I'm going to do after the, the war's over. I, I was a physics major in school, uh -huh. uh, but I had to interrupt that, of course. But I decided that I was going to be an independent inventor as I always wanted to be. I had no money, so I chose a, an occupation to specialize in. And, and having no money, I, I uh, chose toys. I figured that might be easiest to get into. And that's how I got into toys. And that's I why I started to think about things. Then after the war, oh, and I designed my first toys while I was on the submarine during the war. Uh, I, I designed three toys and I put them on paper and so I kept a notebook. Uh, but after the war was over, that's when I uh, uh, had the idea for making the teeth. And, and actually, I knew exactly what gave me the idea. I saw an ad in the newspaper for a garage for false teeth. It was a little box with a cover <laughs> to keep it. <laughs> in your bathroom or on your table. And being very young, I thought false teeth were very funny. <laughs> and so then I started thinking about false teeth. And that's when I came up with the idea of making a pair of talking teeth. Amazing, amazing, very, very interesting. And um, how about the gift you discovered for the cereal boxes? Now, I remember those very well. I used to uh, have cereal in the morning and I couldn't wait with my brothers to dig down into the box to see what gift there was. Uh, is that also, uh, where did you get the idea for that? Do you remember what that particular- Well, I was, I was already making toys and, and doing pretty well uh, making toys. And uh, I was at a toy show with my wife and we went from exhibit to exhibit, from room to room. The toy shows were held in uh, uh, first hotels, but then later on in, in the toy buildings in New York. Uh, and I saw an exhibit uh, of a new toy uh, which I thought was interesting and met the guy who was uh, pushing it. He didn't invent it, he was representing it. And, uh, uh, and we got to know each other and he was from Chicago. And his, uh, his name was Hank Saperstein. And he showed me a little viewer, a little plastic viewer that if you look through, uh, you saw a picture. And uh, I said, what is this? He says, oh, this is a premium. This is, I'm trying to sell the uh, uh, cereal companies on, but I'm not having very much luck. And I like, that's when I really found out about premiums. And uh, I said, okay. And uh, we got together in Chicago when we both came back and I thought I'd make some uh, items some little toys that suitable for premiums. And I made this little tiny water gun. <laughs> really worked. The world's smallest water gun. <laughs> and I went to Hank with it and he loved it. And he went to the Leo Burnett Agency, which represents Kellogg Toys, uh, Kellogg Cereal Company. <laughs> and they bought it in an instant, which means we were gonna manufacture it then, Hank and I. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, we sold this little uh, water gun to uh, uh, Kellogg's for two cents a piece. 
and it cost us a penny to make the whole gun and assemble and pack it so it could be put in a box of cereal. <laughs> I love it. I love, I love the story behind that. And, and we, and it was our first experience and everything went so smoothly. I took care of the uh, engineering and I took care of the production and the manufacturing. We found a very reliable companies in Chicago and it worked out very well. And then, uh, and then we made some others. And, and that's how I got in the premium business. And I went out of the premium, but it was always for Kellogg's cereal. And I went out of the business when they said they can't afford the two cents anymore for a little toy, that they would just print something on the back of the cereal box, like puzzles and things yeah. like that. And so they went out of that end uh, for years. And I, of course, was still making toy, inventing toys and going to the various toy companies uh, to find a place to. Lynn, um, even though your dad had a separate business and shop away from the house, as you mentioned, surely growing up, he must have brought home many of these little toys. What did you all think about your dad and his toys? Did you just think, wow, this is neat. We have a dad who makes toys. Well, yes, I mean, we thought it was great. And also he was always very creative and innovative. And so, you know, I remember we would have like the best Halloween costumes because he would, you know, engineer them, you know, with lights and things like that. And, you know, he'd be involved in helping us with creating things on school projects. And so it wasn't just toys, it was his inventive, and creative mind, and um, uh, and so that was, you know, real. That that was definitely part of, you know, our lives. Um, and you know, the other part of it is that he and my mother both really encouraged creativity. You know, independence. Mm -hmm. You know, to follow your vision, to follow what you want to do you know, because that's the way they were, you know, and so that was also the kind of atmosphere that I grew up in. But the other part of it is because, you know, when my father would bring home toys, um, they were models, they were prototypes, and we we're always sworn to secrecy. I mean, it wasn't anything like you could bring your friends over and play with something. You know, well, because so they were secret. Was, yeah. <laughs> so that was all, you know, secret. So everybody knew that, you know, he was a toy inventor. And certainly around the holidays, toy companies would send us a lot of toys. So we, you know, we had them as well. But, um, uh, you know, it just really multi, you know, faceted in the way that we grew up. Well, the last toy I want to mention to you, because again, um, it means something to me. Uh, and one of your biggest items was the little toy cars and trucks. And um, I could see why, because I remember my own son, David, when he was young, I could still see him clutching on to one of those little trucks. It went everywhere with us, restaurants, movies, Wherever we took David, he had to have his little toy car. So uh, what inspired you to invent those? Those, those were the stompers. And uh, to this day, there are thousands of collectors I didn't even know, uh, Lynn found out about them, who still collect them and are very active in collecting them and selling them to each other. And uh, I, I mean, thousands of them, uh, but they're stompers. And that item started with an associate of mine who was working with me, uh, who uh, came up, uh, actually started the idea of thinking of making a, a miniature vehicle, but it wasn't, it wasn't a hobby 
vehicle. It wasn't an exact copy. It was copies of well-known cars and trucks, but we modified them. We made them look tougher and rougher. We made them uh, with larger wheels and uh, things like that, but you could still recognize the, uh, the vehicle. And my associate had worked for uh, the car companies in Detroit, and he was a tremendous designer, and he really these detailed uh, all, all, all of these for years and years and years uh, for the uh, toy company that uh, made them. So at the end of the film, it showed us you sitting in the villages where you live in California and in a writing workshop. So I'm assuming from that part of the film that you uh, now live in this beautiful retirement village in California and you attend all kinds of activities, but it seems that you picked up writing and that you love writing. So how does that fill a need for you now, writing? Well, I, uh, again, I, I started writing, no, no, I, I started thinking about writing stories when I was probably 19 or something. And, but I never had the patience to sit down and write them on paper and correct my mistakes. Uh, and I never, of course, had a typewriter that was, uh, that was an expensive item. Um, oh, at that time, I, I met a girl who wanted to be a writer, but she didn't have ideas. So we teamed up and we, uh, and she, we wrote our first story and, uh, and I fell for her. I kind of liked her. And uh, she didn't feel the same way. So that broke up our writing combination. But the war started. <laughs> the war started regardless. And I was off uh, to the Navy. So, uh, so then, uh, and not until the computer came about, and I realized how easy it was to write on using a computer. I can make my changes, I can delete, I can erase, I can change. And so then I started uh, writing stories on my own. And I really started where a, new, a neighborhood newspaper called the Acorn in Thousand Oaks ran a contest for a hundred word story. I didn't realize that this was a well-known hobby all over the world, writing a hundred word story. And I joined the contest and lost. But I liked the idea of writing a hundred word stories and I kept on doing it. And then I wrote much longer stories, but I still sort of, uh, spend most of my time as far as writing, uh, writing a 100 word stories, an entire story in exactly a hundred words, which is sort of an exercise. And, uh, and I relax doing that. And what other activities are you enjoying out there besides writing? Well, I've got as, as a tiny machine shop in my garage. I'm the only one that has that here. And uh, I make things, I make things, I make a lot of things for seniors. Seniors, as you know, I'm sure you've uh, heard about it, like to fall and hurt yeah. themselves. And so uh, uh, my wife was ill and so I made all kinds of things for her. And uh, like what? What do you mean? I I things in the bathroom, in the shower, uh, to keep her from falling. Uh -huh. And she never fell, 
until we went to the uh, went to a film festival <laughs> in Palm Springs, and she fell in the bathroom <laughs> and oh. broke her hip. Wow. Uh, and that uh, she she was already ill before that, uh, but that uh, that didn't help much. And so I I make all kinds of things for uh, uh, seniors, things to help them pick up stuff. Some seniors can't bend down, as you might suspect. And uh, and but then I I do toys and I do. A, all kinds of things, not just toys, uh, but it's a, it really relaxes me to be able to start something from the beginning and end up with them. With Do you then distribute home. it at your retirement village? You, do you give these things away to the people there? Well, I, I, you're not, my lawyer told me a long time ago, I have to be very careful that if someone, uh, if I gave something to someone and he had an accident with it, there is no guarantee that, that someone with a, in a wheelchair still can't have an accident. That he may not sue me, but his kids may. <laughs> So I have to be very careful. I, I've exposed them and, and show them how to make things and they can make them th themselves. I, I was going to say, maybe a workshop for seniors there on how to make uh, these kind of things. Um, do people there know who you are? Do they know about you and your background and the things in the film and all well, the things well, that you create? Do they know? Do they know who you are? They uh, they know who I am because I am one. My wife and I were one of the uh, ten or twelve families that were the first to move here uh, when it was built. So uh, they know us for being here a long time, uh, and they know and and they know me a lot more since Lynn's documentary. <laughs> Uh, they had a have chance. They, have they shown to... it there at the uh, retirement village? Lynn, have uh, you shown the film? Yeah, a, a lot of people have seen it here. And, uh, but as I say, they know me because I'm one of the oldest uh, uh, residents people here. Uh, not just how long I've been here, but how old I am. I try to keep it a secret, but it's not easy. So and I think the audience would like to know that Lynn only lives about an hour from Eddie. So how often do you get over there to visit him? Well, since the virus. Oh, that's right. My kids can't come here. Um, uh, and uh, But we have a Zoom every Friday. Good. It's nice. And That's so nice. we we keep in very close touch. Beautiful. And and my son works, uh, took over uh, the company and works mostly with older items that we've had with companies all over the world. But he handles that. I have nothing to do with it anymore. And uh, so it's very nice. So I keep very, very busy. Uh, uh, doing creative work just as you do, which I think is very healthy for us. Yes. And, and uh, I think so. I hope that so I get I'm to 99. Doing... I hope I get to 99. Oh, it's okay. easy. You just have to keep going. <laughs> that's, that's what my mother always used to say. She made it to 99. And her words to me always were, no matter what, Miriam, in her Hungarian accent, just keep on going, darling, just keep on going. So I really appreciate those words of inspiration, not just for me, but for many of the audience who are seniors like us in that uh, we have to keep our minds going and no matter how we feel, and I'm sure there are many mornings when you wake up and you go, I think I'll just stay in bed, but we have to get those feet out on the floor and to That's the computer. It and uh, keep on going. Um, this has been 
such a wonderful meeting. Eddie, I'm going to have to privately talk to you about what you make for the shower because I'm having a bit of difficulty for that. Uh, Lynn, do you have any final words about the joy of making this film and and the responses you're getting from other film festivals and places where you're showing the film? Uh, I mean, it's really been a wonderful experience, you know, both to make the film, to get my, to know my father in a different way and to realize how many people really um, just love meeting Eddie, you know, I mean, it's really, I, we get, you know, we get, you know, emails, you know, from all over the world. Um, really, people just really both, you know, appreciate his enthusiasm and, um, uh, and, you know, and, and the legacy that he leaves for all of us and his optimism. And so that's really been wonderful. Um, you know, we also, uh, we have the, the film right now is on the New Yorkers, you know, um, uh, uh, website and, and on YouTube and people can see it. You can, you know, after the film festival, you could share it if you want people, okay. you know. Did, friends, did you, you submit know. this for an award for any of the um, award organizations? Did you submit it? Well, we submitted for the Oscars and we didn't make it. <laughs> so. It's hard. It's difficult to get them to accept uh, films. Uh, that but, would have been so exciting, wouldn't it have been to just imagine going to get your Oscar. <laughs> it would be virtual this year, so it wouldn't be quite yeah. the same. But um, we did, win, you know, we've been, I think, at 17 film festivals so far. We won Best Documentary at... Um, and two of them, so it's been really, oh, really? wonderful. Well, maybe that'll happen for the Miami Jewish Film <laughs> Festival as well. Well, I hope that I get to meet the two of you again. Eddie, it's been a joy. It's been a pleasure and inspiration to me to get there. And Lynn, uh, it's been a pleasure to meet you as well. So uh, with that, I want to say to you, uh, the Hidrod in Hebrew, which is we will meet again, and bracha in blessings. I'm a rabbi's daughter, so uh, <laughs> I was raised a certain way. And uh, I wish you only the best with this film. It's a beautiful film. And for people who are watching this discussion, who haven't seen the film, but decided to hear the discussion first, watch the film, Eddie's Family. It was a wonderful, and it is a wonderful film. So with that, I'm going to say um, goodbye and thank you very much for participating in this wonderful panel with me. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, it was nice meeting you. Very nice Bye. meeting you, Eddie, very nice. And you and Lynn as well.